Hello, thank you. I'm Anthony Reeve from the Geological Survey. And this talk is about the smoking nickel gun in the Western Gawler Craton. Now the Gawler Craton is well known for its iron oxide copper gold deposits such as Olympic Dam or Prominent Hill. And perhaps this focus on the iron oxide copper gold deposit type has given the Gawler Craton a, a bit of a feel of a, it being a one horse town. But I think that what I wanna to talk to you about today is the fact that there is an emerging recognition that there is potential for nickel copper sulfide mineralization in the Gawler Craton, particularly the Western Gawler Craton, and that there is more strings to the bow of the Gawler Craton yet to come. This map here shows you the nickel potential across Australia. It's, it's a, mineral, a mineral systems approach and potential uh, nickel potential modeling by Geoscience Australia published in 2015. They looked at the energy drivers, the lithospheric architecture or constituent sources and, and gradients of physical and chemical parameters and created mappable criteria that relate to these features of the mineral system. And on the basis of that, they were able to rank high or low various areas across Australia. If we zoom into the Western Gawler Craton, you'll see that these areas are not ranked particularly lowly. In fact, it's moderate nickel potential across the area. Now I've shown on this map the pre-2010 deposits or prospects. These are prospects or occurrences of nickel which were known prior to 2010, that is uh, prior to this 2015 uh, publication. Now if we put on there the deposits, of, sorry, the prospects that we know now, you can see that there's a whole raft of new ones, Sahara, Splendor, Woodford and Mystic, which all occur in this northeast trending belt of um, enhanced prospectivity according to the GSIS Australia modelling. Now that enhanced uh, prospectivity region is known as the Fowler Domain or Fowler Belt in the Western Gawler Craton. And there has been a lot of speculation over the years that there is nickel potential in there. In there. And that is based on drilling, on intersections of Mayfield rocks and so on over the years. But these four new prospects which have been announced and discovered this year actually really, I believe, change the dial on how we understand the prospectivity in this area. Some key exploration targeting for this type of deposit um, are, based on the great work of Graham Begg and others, things like the presence of a large igneous province, intercontinental region at the time of that mineralizing event, the large volume of mafic and ultramafic rocks, and multiple intrusions. Uh, what we'd like to see is margins of lithospheric domains and that those domains are bounded by lithospheric scale structures. This enables connectivity between the mantle and the upper crust. Ideally, you have compressional deformation or, or transpressional deformation happening at the time of intrusion, and this provides a focusing mechanism for those magmas. We definitely want to see anomalously primitive intrusions, and sometimes you can also see gravity uh, anomalies in the region, which suggests that there are deep-seated maybe rock, uh, rock kind of intrusions in that area. So if you have some of these key criteria, you might expect to find nickel deposits. So what I'd like to do in this talk is you know, go through some of these um, criteria in terms of how we understand the Western Gore Crater. And I'd like to come back to this slide at the end and see how well we're doing in terms of this checklist. To understand uh, lithospheric architecture, or at least uh, lithospheric domains, crustal domains, near the isotopes are a really fantastic way to do that. A lot of work has come out of Western Australia, the Yilgarn Craton in particular, which shows the near the isotopes uh, mapping different lithospheric scale domains. Here I'm showing you the epsilon near the uh, well, All you need to know about this is that if, it's, if the number is high, it's more evolved and older. If the number is low, it's more juvenile and typically younger. The key point here, based on this compilation of a lot of uh, academic research and some of the work Geoscience Australia and Geological Survey have done, the key point here is that there is, you can see a belt of blue colour. Okay, they've, they've gridded up these, uh, um, these data to show it in kind of a grid form. And now the blue area is evolved us and evolved lithosphere and that corresponds precisely to where we know there are old rocks out there this is what's called the mole mapping complex and in the southern area just focus on the southern area you can see these uh, more greeny and yellowy colors these are more juvenile rocks so broadly there is this kind of isotopic isotopic boundary in this area that is between these old archaean rocks and these younger juvenile rocks so there's this isotopic broad boundary zone it's not well defined the data are very sparse but it suggests that there is compositional variation in there. Now let's focus on this area around where the Sahara Prospect itself is. 
in the TMI image here, total magnetic intensity image here, you see the Molgathin complex. I've talked about that RP in basement up there. And this juvenile, uh, more juvenile complex down to the south, which is known as the St. Peter suite. These are an intrusive complexes in the south. And between those two, you see domains of relatively moderate uh, magnetic intensity. And you can see that those sort of um, uh, magnetic intensity blobs and blocks are dissected, they're dismembered by a whole raft of major shear zones which just go charging across the countryside. Now those shear zones kind of correspond to where that broad isotopic boundary is. It also corresponds to the broad distinction between the old and the younger rocks. Now interestingly, if we look at this area in terms of gravity, you do see that those nickel prospects uh, and occurrences are actually um, associated with longer wavelength gravity features, which may be permissive of there being maker contrusions in the, in the mid or even lower crust. So that's a kind of interesting uh, um, data set. In terms of the total magnetic intensity, again, in the Gawler Crater on Airborne Survey images, which are just released this year by the Geological Survey, just focusing in on the Sahara area. Uh, now, in this area, we've actually got very sparse eucanology, there are a few data points, and these data points, plus others from the area, enable us to make some broad characterization of the lithostratigraphy in this area. And it's interesting that there are actually sort of compositional domains in this area. Now, I talked about the, uh, the Archean Molgathian complex that sits in the north here. Well, just to the south of that, some of these magnetic high features, they're actually 1740 intrusive suites, including 1735 MA gabbroids, which are known further to the south. There are um, uh, metasedimentary rocks in there, and they are certainly affected by metamorphic and de deformation event at about 1700 MA. To the south of that, you see actually the 1620 intrusives that I mentioned, and a whole raft of 1585 intrusives. Now this 1585 number is really important in terms of the geology of the Gaula Craton. This is that magmatic event with large igneous province associated with all of those iron oxide copper gold deposits. So, a lot of people will be looking for this 1585 number and thinking, oh, that's associated with mineralization. Well, at least in this area, we think that the 1585 um, magnetism is to the south, as far as we know from existing geochronology. But it's interesting that that isotopic boundary I showed in those slides before, the broad composition between a northern Archean complex and a southern juvenile complex is actually mirrored again at the smaller scale between an older and younger um, um, lithostratigraphic luthos domains, which are bound by major shear zones. If we look at those shear zones, I've just done this sort of PowerPoint interpretation for simplicity here, but there are these major shear zones which charge, charge across this geology and they are connected by a series of, you know, of, of second order splays. Those second order splays have a certain kinematics on them, which you can see here, which suggests that there may well be opposing vergences or opposing kinematics on these shear zones, suggesting there's possibly more than one event out here. Now don't take my word for it, actually John Stewart has done his PhD a few years ago now on the, on the Gawler Crater, on the structural geology and, and, and interpretation out there. And he published this very nice paper looking at the different phases of deformation, including this more north-northwest compressional deformation event resulting in sinistral strike slip, and then switching to a sort of a northwest, slightly less uh, high angle uh, compression, resulting in more dextral strike slip as well as folding. Now, John Stewart interpreted this, these two phases to be 1585 and 1450 in timing. Uh, it's certainly possible. However, I think we're, we're, we're well off the, we're, we're, we're not quite at that point yet in terms of actually dating these structures, but it's certainly plausible that we have either a progressive and continuous uh, uh, deformation event or, or at least two phases of deformation in that area. John Stewart also produced this fantastic um, um, forward model, a cross section through the Fowler domain. So northwest on the left, uh, southeast on the right, and showing you this sort of, both, both using, using both uh, magnetics and gravity, he was able to produce this forward model which explains the magnetic intensity and gravity signatures in that area. And he explains it by a positive flower structure. And you can see that these steep shear zones seem to correspond to where you have a lithostratigraphic packages, that is this gray material versus the reds and the blues. And this is certainly associated with strike slip deformation and these changes in compression and extension directions, as I mentioned. Now the connectivity between the crust and the mantle was established very well by this magneto um data published by Stefan Thiel and, and Graham Heinsen a few years ago. 
where they ran across the uh, phthalo belt, this magnetotelluric um, section across the phthalo belt, and they were able to demonstrate deep um, conductivity zones, which, which broadly correspond to where some of those big shear zones are. So those shear zones are actually mantle tapping. So we have mantle tapping shear zones uh, into um, in sort of strike slip or transpressional systems in the, in the crust. Let's have a look at just a focus on two of these prospects now. I want to talk about Sahara and then Aristarchus in particular. Now the Sahara prospect was uh, announced this year by Western Areas in their, under their Aluka JV. Um, it's no understatement to say this is probably one of the most significant exploration results uh, for South Australia this year, largely because it shows you that there is this entirely different mineral system potential out in this region. Uh, it was discovered on the back of an EM anomaly, um, very shallow cover out here, uh, perhaps at most 50 metres, and there's broad intervals of elevated nickel sulphide um, um, within um, both the disseminated as well as these massive sulphides here that we show in this picture, uh, within gabbros, gabbronorites, and certainly within pyroxenite intrusions. Fantastic result. In the Aristarchus prospect, uh, the exploration there was uh, occurred early in the 80s, and there was some departmental, uh, departmental uh, of, um, energy and mining drilling out there in the 90s, and subsequent drilling again by mineral resources in the 2000s. And, and all of this drilling has shown conclusively that there are ultramafic rocks in that area. I'll show you an um, example here of the peroxenite. The peroxenite intrudes 2480 million year old felsic gneiss. Uh, the age of the peroxenite itself is not known, but you can see that it cuts that uh, felsic gneiss. It has uh, a chilled margin there, and it is incorporates a little bit of that crustal material into that, into that peroxenite. The peroxide itself, you can see olivine preserved within it, although for the most part, the olivine is just preserved as few relics. So that's why it's uh, a peroxide rather than, rather than actually a, a peridotite, for example. But there is the, uh, there is the hint that there, were, there are actually peridotites out there, uh, which have these, these, certainly have these ultramatic characteristics. They have uh, penlodite in them, as well as uh, minor chalcopyrite and horror. So the, not all the nickel went into the silicate minerals. It was certainly crystallized out in terms of sulfides in some uh, intervals. Unfortunately, there's been no uh, economic intersections out here, but it's certainly, this is some of that smoke, which is suggesting that there is uh, potential for a real fire of this nickel uh, prospectivity or nickel deposits in this region. In terms of the geochemistry of that Aristarchus uh, peroxenite system, you can see here in terms of the spider plot, so-called spider plot on the left, which is the rare earth elements, uh, red, um, uh, plotted against uh, uh, enriched mid ocean enriched basalt, this so called EMORB. And basically, it's a one to one relationship. It basically is enriched, um, it's, it's some, some type of rich, enriched uh, basalt, it's thinospheric melt effectively. Now, one of the samples has slightly elevated uh, light rare earths on the left of that diagram and a little europium anomaly, which suggests both crustal assimilation and some degree of fraction crystallization as influence has occurred during the magmatic in um, uh, the life of this magma. And that's certainly uh, also a positive for, uh, for, for potential uh, sulfide crystallization. In terms of the chromium nickel values, these certainly ally with um, ultramafic rocks, sort of basically olivine cumulates. Now, if we then loop back to where we started in terms of some of the key exploration criteria for nickel sulfide deposits, what is the Western Gaula crater and how does it stack up? Do we have a large igneous province? Well, we do in the Gawler Crater, that's this 1585 event or 1590 event, which is associated with the iron oxide copper gold deposits. Is it associated with these nickel prospects? We just don't know yet. Was it intracontinental at the time? We don't know because we don't know the age of the, of the mineralization yet either. Were there a large volume of mafic and ultramafic rocks? Were there multiple events? Yes, we can certainly say there are some gabbros, there are peroxenites, and, and it looks like there's multiple events in, that, in the area. So I would, I'll give that a yes. Are we on the margin of lithospheric domains? Yes, I think the isotopes are certainly suggesting that. And we have different lithostratigraphic packages in that area. And that, 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 um, uh, those prospects in the Fowler domain seem to lie roughly parallel to where you might expect to see those, broad, those broader lithostratigraphic boundaries. And they connect roughly with where there are definitely translithospheric scale structures. You see that both in that, um, geophysical modelling, but also in the magnetotelluric images. Was there compressional deformation? Definitely tectonic friction, probably. Was it during magmatic emplacement? We're not sure yet. Again, we, we need further work on the age of these intrusives to work that out, but that's a, that's a potential. 
Are there anomalously primitive intrusions? Certainly. Uh, and is there evidence in the gravity data of uh, deep-seated mafic intrusives? Oh, well, I think there is potentially. So I think in summary, <coughs> while the age and tectonic affinity of these mafic rocks associated with these new nickel discoveries in the Western Gorilla Craton are very poorly understood, more work is certainly required on them. Um, we are seeing the first hints of really interesting um, smoke, nickel smoke coming out of the Gorilla Craton here. Let's hope with further exploration, uh, uh, there will find the, the nickel fire. So thank you very much to all the work for the companies that are operating out there. I know this year has been particularly difficult, but this is some really excellent technical successes. So best of luck to all of the people that are working in that area. Uh, and thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed the talk. Please feel free to get in touch if there's any other questions or comments. Uh, thanks very much.